Hi, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri appellate attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. And today, I am bothered. And the reason I'm bothered is because it seems that the processes that are supposed to make sure that we live in a free and viable society are at times breaking down in ways that I would have thought unthinkable 10 years ago. And today what I'm talking about specifically is a tiny little town, a population of less than 2,000 in the state of Kansas, which is, I think, one of the most conservative states in the country. And out there in an absolute abuse of power, the police seized the workings of a working newspaper. So we need to talk about that. But first, we need to talk a little bit about what the law is. The law, of course, starts with the Constitution. And the First Amendment guarantees freedom of the press. And the Fourth Amendment protects you against unreasonable search and seizure. And the Fifth Amendment protects you against deprivation of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, there's, those are three pretty significant, I think, pretty significant rules that ought to always be respected. In fact, guilty people have gone free because those rules have not been respected, particularly the Fourth and Fifth Amendment rules. And so I find it especially odious when those, those provisions are simply ignored in order to essentially address a problem that one person might have. Now let's also talk about how the First Amendment has been interpreted. I have often said that the First Amendment is the most liberally construed amendment of the Bill of Rights. One reason that's good is because you want the free exchange of information. You want people to be able to talk to one another. You want people to be able to report things, even if later on those things turn out not to be true. The idea is that a, a free press is a bulwark against oppression. It is a safeguard for liberty. Most of y'all are probably too young to remember something called the Pentagon Papers. During the Vietnam War, the United States government undertook a classified study to look at the decision-making that was being done during that war. And specifically, they looked at the decision-making of military leaders and they, the study pointed out a number of things that had been screwed up during the Vietnam War. It was very embarrassing to the military, and there was a guy by the name of Daniel Ellsberg, who at the time was roundly criticized for doing it, but he took a copy of that classified report to the Washington Post and the New York Times. And the New York Times and the Washington Post when they started to check on sources, found out that indeed this was a classified document and that indeed it was a real thing and they went to publish it and the government went and got an injunction against both the New York Times and the Washington Post. All of this is summarized very neatly for us in the opinion. Let's take a look at that now. This is from the New York Times versus the United States and it is a per curiam opinion which essentially means that pretty much everybody agrees. It says, We granted certiorari in these cases in which the U.S. seeks to enjoin the New York Times and Washington Post publishing the contents of a classified study entitled History of U.S. Decision-Making Process on Vietnam Policy. Any system of prior restraints of expression comes to this court bearing a heavy presumption against its constitutional validity. The government thus carries a heavy burden of showing justification for imposition of such a restraint. The District Court for the Southern District of New York in the New York Times case and the District Court for the District of Columbia and Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit in the Washington Post case held the government had not met that burden. We agree. The judgment of the Court of Appeals for the District Court of, for the District of 
Columbia Circuit is therefore affirmed. The order of the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit is reversed, and the case is remanded with directions to enter a judgment, affirming the judgment of the District Court of the Southern District of New York. The stays entered June 25, 1971 by the court are vacated. Judgments shall issue forthwith, so ordered. And then Black and Douglas concurred, and they said that every moment's continuance of injunctions against these newspapers amounts to a flagrant, indefensible, and continuing violation of the First Amendment. So it's fairly difficult to see how anybody who was even reasonably familiar with the law of the First Amendment would authorize any kind of prior restraint against a newspaper. Now that we have the history and the backdrop against which all of this matters, let's talk a little bit about what happened in Marion. In Marion, there was a restaurant owner by the last name of Newell. And like many people uh, do, apparently that individual drove under the influence of, of uh, alcohol, was ticketed and was convicted of driving under the influence and, and in accordance with you know, state law, she was ordered not to drive for a certain period of time. And the allegation that was published uh, or was being circulated was that she had continued to do that and that the police knew about it and weren't doing anything about her continuing to drive. Well, this information was communicated to the newspaper and the newspaper in good technique, I think, went to try and validate this. So they went to the court records, I'm assuming, and they, they tried very hard to determine whether or not this was actually true because they had a suspicion that this was coming out of the restaurant owner's divorce and they did not want to publish anything that wasn't 100% accurate. And then at, at, there were a couple of things that happened. One was that a uh, congressperson had set up a meeting at, his, at this person's restaurant, at Newell's restaurant, and the, the person who owned the restaurant threw them out, the press, threw the press out because she was upset that they were looking into her alleged misdeeds. And the congressman apologized afterwards, saying, hey, I invited the press, and I didn't want you kicked out. Then the police got involved, and they raided the offices of the newspaper, and they raided the individual reporter's home, including the 98-year-old owner of the newspaper. It stressed her so much that she had a heart attack and died. So... You can understand how somebody who has spent the last probably 70 years in journalism would be terribly upset at seeing her life's work, even in this small little town, a weekly newspaper, a, a newspaper that came out once a week. You can understand how she would be devastated that somebody came in and seized all of her computers. They seized the computers at the at the newspaper, they seized her personal computers, they seized her reporters' personal computers and phones, all in an effort to, to find out who had supposedly stolen the identity of the restaurant owner to get this information to the newspaper. And so the, the police department's defense in this case was, hey, we were investigating a crime, and the crime we were investigating was identity theft. I would say more likely the crime they were investigating was journalism because the fact is the, the newspaper had a right to go get that. If you get convicted of a crime, unless for some reason your file is sealed by a judge, it's public record. It's out there for anybody who wants to go look at it. And that there's absolutely no way that any of that could have been proper grounds to institute a search and seizure of a newspaper. Ideally, an action would be filed in district court in Kansas, uh, perhaps in federal district court in Kansas, to immediately return all of the material back to these uh, reporters and to the, to the newspaper. Uh, there is a federal statute on point that says you can't get things from a newspaper through search warrants. 
you absolutely have to use a subpoena, which gives people a right to uh, essentially comply or be forced to comply. And that is a much safer procedure for the Constitution. I think pretty much everybody in law enforcement would know that. And again, that's why I think this is one of those cases where there's no official immunity for what they've done. It's a pretty shocking case. And one that ought to disturb all of us, that we have people out there enforcing the law who do not know one of the most important cases in the First Amendment, and certainly one that should always guide the application of the law with respect to newspapers and other instruments of the press. Over the past couple of years, there have been a lot of reports and a lot of stories that have come out from newspapers that have just not been true. For the most part, none of those papers have ever been held accountable for the errors that they've made, principally because in many cases they were made in good faith based on, on information that came to them in a way that cloaked its bad provenance. And for that reason, those people should not be held accountable. But the one absolute way they should never be held accountable is to have all of their stuff seized. That's what happens in third world banana republics. That's what I have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. If you have the opportunity today, go out of your way and do something kind for someone. Catch me down here at the beach next time. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.